This episode of Bulletproof Cashflow is brought to you by Realty Dynamics. Learn how people like you can build substantial passive income while creating wealth for the long term through real estate investing. Visit rdyne.com. That's R D Y N E.com. During a tough time, a recession, Augustine, a lot of people make a change. That change could be change in job, a change in location, uh, downsizing, moving in with family, moving in with friends. That type of change uh, increases during tough times, and that increases the demand for self-storage. So similarly, there's data going back showing self-storage REIT performance in 2008-ish. It was up significantly. Um, So value of those REITs because demand had gone up for storage. Working because you want to, not because you have to, is financial freedom. And we want to help you create that. Welcome to the Bulletproof Cashflow Show. We're going to teach you how to achieve lifetime financial freedom through real estate investment. Your host is a multifamily syndicator and property developer. He's done deals reaching into the hundreds of millions of dollars. You'll hear from experts in all aspects of real estate investment, finance, finance, development, and management. Everything you need is right here. This is the Bulletproof Cashflow Show. And this is your host, Augustino Pintus. Hey, awesome people. Ever wondered how you discovered this show? Was it a tweet? Was it LinkedIn? There's no ads or sponsorships here, just pure passion. So if someone guided you here, do me a favor, pay it forward, share it, review it, spread the word. You rock and your support is everything. Thanks so much. Hey everyone, it's Augustino. Building a recession resilient real estate portfolio and navigating today's ever changing environment can be stressful, right? But you can become stronger on the other side if you do the right thing and make the right moves. Now, our next guest knows all about this. He has over a billion dollars of property transactions with a long running 17 year career in real estate investing. He has established an impressive portfolio spanning residential and commercial properties across various markets in the U.S. He is the co-founder of SMK Capital, where he brings his extensive experience as an avid real estate investor for over 15 years. Now, currently, the company has active investments in over 40 commercial real estate deals comprising of a portfolio of over 120 properties nationwide. Now, with all that, I'd like to welcome Mark Curry to the show. Mark, buddy, thanks for coming on, man. My pleasure, Augustino. Thanks for having me today. Awesome, awesome. Now, guys, if you go to Marcus to say you can reach him via the contact page at smkcap.com. Okay, Mark, go ahead and tell the listeners about your journey. Sure. Yeah, I started Augustino in um, uh, corporate America, worked in finance for a number of years. That was 2002 to 2010. Started investing in real estate on the side, you know, very active, how we, a lot of us get started. That was in 05 before the recession. Um, bought my first place. The, the prices kept going up. The valuation went up. I took out a line of credit, partnered with my brother, bought a fourplex. It was distressed uh, and just kept going. We were partnering basically just with family, Augustino, my parents, my brothers, myself, uh, pooling our capital together, buying distressed assets through to 2010. At that point, um, I was completely hooked, of course, fell in love with the idea of continuing to grow our portfolio and raising capital from others. So my father and I partnered up. We formed our company, SMK Capital Management, in 2010 and uh, continued uh, to, to acquire uh, predominantly distressed assets uh, with partners, uh, people that already trusted us and knew us, of course. We operated a portfolio of single family, small multifamily assets, uh, around 60 plus properties across a few different states, Augustino. And then by uh, uh, 2012, 2013, we really started diversifying. That was a big part of a shift and a pivot for us. I started investing personally into some assets that had done well through the recession. There wasn't a lot you could uh, point at and say, wow, look at that. It's through 2008-9, but uh, mobile homes was one, self-storage was another, some uh, apartments. um, And we started really just spreading our capital out as an LP into other operating partners, investments, learning, watching. After about five years of doing that, we had built some pretty good relationships um, with trusted operators in asset classes that we found that probably had lower risk and similar or greater returns 
than some of the stuff we were doing on our own. And so we started pivoting and uh, became a, a essentially a private equity firm, syndicating assets and investments with our investors and our operating partners that we had uh, active capital with. And that's that's re- really where our focus remains today. Diversification, spreading capital across asset classes, regions, and operating partners. So when you say distressed assets, for those people that are listening, how do you guys define a distressed asset, number one? And number two, how do you know you're getting, you're, you're paying the right price for that distressed asset? Sure. Well, uh, there's a few ways that come to mind. First, obviously, if you're buying bank-owned property, short sales, REOs, foreclosures, those are uh, distressed assets. Uh, then you could also have a distressed seller who's forced to sell and maybe not bank-owned, but if they don't sell, it could become bank-owned. And so we look at those, or we looked at those in the past and invested a lot of those over the years. Um, and how do you know if you're getting a right, a right buy, Augustino? Well, there's a few variables, of course. You want to look at comparable sales. You want to look at cash flow. You want to look at margin between income and expenses, how much is left over. Um, and, and you're trying to find essentially kind of more no-brainer deals where you're not too worried about the market conditions. Like, I'll give you an example. We are investing this week into a self-storage facility with an operating partner. They sourced this property a few years ago. It's an elderly couple, husband and wife. It's 20 minutes from their office. Um, the self-storage facility has been run by them for, I think, two decades. They haven't raised rents in, honestly, God knows how long, Augustino. The husband just passed away. The wife doesn't really know what to do or want. She's 80 years old. I mean, She's not even collecting the rent and they're buying it for just an amazing price. So you, you ask yourself, do I care what the market's doing when your rents are hundred percent below market? You know, you can literally double them. And in self storage, you've got 30 day leases, so you can increase the rents rather quickly. Um, so that is a kind of opportunity where we would consider it to be not distressed, but y- you almost want to buy it in any market uh, condition. Right. But I think to, to buy that deal, It sounds to me like you have to have the lender, the debt lined up way in advance. Like this is something you have to plan for, like when times are even good to say that, okay, you know, lender partner guy or whatever. At some point when the market turns, we want to start doing X, Y, Z. Are you guys on board with helping us take down that debt? Because right now trying to get your hands on debt these days, even a deal that good, we just described here a second ago, is still rather tricky, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could get it, but it's not very favorable. You're not going to get a lot of leverage because the operating performance of the asset thus far has been uh, poor, right? You're not really collecting rents. Um, I think there's a a good amount of vacancy. They're not even trying to fill it. They're not even marketing, advertising, you name it. So if you go to a lender and say, hey, I want to leverage this, you know, good luck. You're not going to get great terms. So what our operating partner is doing, they're just buying it all cash, Augustino. They're going to improve the financials, the performance, the occupancy, the trailing three month uh, P&L, and then go out for refinancing in three to six months. And so it's very strategic on purpose. Once the asset is a little bit more stabilized, you get much better terms. Yes, yes, yes. So right now, I know we're in the green room, we're talking about multifamily, but you you mentioned two things that was rather interesting. Of course, self-storage, you just mentioned a second ago, and mobile home parks too. I think you might've mentioned that in the green room. would you f- say that those two assets are somewhat res- recession resistant then as opposed to multifamily or do you guys still doing, is there anything on the table or what are you trying to find these days? Yeah, uh, pretty darn close to what you said, Augustino. So self-storage and mobile home parks have historically been recession resistant. It's an investment strategy that we've been practicing since 2018. Uh, we saw some indicators in the marketplace at that time that there could be a market correction, a downturn. We created a recession resistant fund on purpose to go out and invest in what we call lowly correlated or uncorrelated or sometimes inversely correlated assets to the overall economy and market. So what makes them recession resistant uh, is I think your question, but essentially you see an increase in demand for the asset type during tough economic conditions and a recession. So if you think about mobile home parks, they're essentially one of, if not the most affordable housing option out there. Um, they're not making really any more of them, Augustino, in desirable areas that are actually affordable. Uh, most of the 
mobile home parks out there today were developed in the 60s and 70s that are within a, a major MSA. And so you have a kind of a moat around you from a supply growth standpoint. So there isn't a lot of new competition coming on. It's one of the things that makes it unique. Um, a lot of the residents own their home, Augustino. They're not very mobile. They tend to stay there uh, for decades. And there's a lot of data around that. Uh, we started investing in mobile homes in 2011-ish, give or take, Augustino. We saw, just met some operating partners that were still in that space for many, many years. And there's a lot of data that shows that net operating income growth has actually remained quite steady and actually grown during recessions. So a lot of data around that asset class having resilience. Self-storage, uh, very similar uh, from a couple standpoints. You see during a tough time, a recession, Augustine, a lot of people make a change. That change could be change in job, a change in location, uh, downsizing, moving in with family, moving in with friends. That type of change uh, increases during tough times, and that increases the demand for self-storage. So similarly, there's data going back showing self-storage REIT performance in 2008-ish. It was up significantly. Um, so value of those REITs because demand had gone up for storage. Now, as far as apartments go, um, we've been investing in apartments for you know a long time, Augustino, almost 20 years. But uh, t the last year and a half, we've really focused on tax exempt, tax abated apartments where we essentially keep half of the units at the property affordable by definition. And the other half can go to the market rate. Um, and it's a public private partnership with the local municipality. And in turn, for keeping those units uh, affordable, you get a 99 year tax exemption. And so property taxes are essentially are are waived uh, in short. And so that is a very favorable advantage to have today. You're actually providing affordable housing and increasing the supply in the local community. So it's a win-win. And we, we're trying to always look for these kinds of strategies, Augustino, where we think there'll be high demand in even volatile market conditions. Yes, yes. Well, to take those three things apart, the, the mobile home scenario, I mean, I looked at mobile homes too, and I, I really do like that asset class just because the individual actually does not usually lease the building or the trailer or whatever it might be. It's actually the, the spot that the trailer sits on, right? So as a landlord, you're not even responsible for the, the building that they live in, the trailer that they live in, right? That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's beautiful. And, and, that's, and they can't leave. If they do, they have to take their trailer with them or they abandon it and you guys get to t keep it then because it's abandoned. <laughs> Right. So they could sell it too. But yes, it, it, it's very much a, a sticky tenant base where they they remain residents. It's a community, Augustino, right? And so a lot of the yep. other neighbors, they help each other out. You have to be able to build and manage that community. Um, but it's a, a very favorable asset class for a lot of those reasons. Yeah, I know. But you also have the, the whole issue of NIMBY, not in my backyard. You have all that scenario to deal with, I'm sure. Uh, actually, I just I just read an article about here in Cleveland where there's actually one of these mobile home parks right near a beach, and supposedly they're tearing that whole place out. I'm not sure how they're going to do it, honestly, but apparently it's some sort of city planning. But I have to imagine that to build, I know they don't build them very often, but you can still build them, I would imagine, but that's to be far enough away, right? Like somewhere far far enough where the city council doesn't really care that's getting built. I mean, are people still doing that kind of thing, or is that? pretty much uh, not happening these days. Hey folks, if you're having a blast, let's take it a notch up. Connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and all the social media platforms where all the fun is happening. Your feedback is like fuel to us, propelling us to even greater and better content and reach to incredible investors just like you. Thanks for being part of this awesome community, and let's get back to the excitement. It's very difficult to build a new mobile home community in a desirable location for a couple reasons, Augustino. One, zoning. If it's not zoned for that use. You, you know, you're going to have a very hard time changing the zoning for one obvious reason. But if you can build, let's just say, in that, that plot in Cleveland that you're talking about, I'm assuming they're raising it because or, or removing it because the highest and best use from an income and tax standpoint for the city too is not mobile home community. It's probably some higher density use. And so um, there's another reason why NIMBYism is not just from neighbors and local community, but also 
from the municipality and the city that's uh, looking to generate more revenue and income from taxes. Exactly, exactly. Because I'm sure you can put a beautiful high rise right there, right next to the beach, have a thousand people living there, all paying taxes and contributing to the community in that way. You know, yeah, so, the, the asset yeah. value would be much higher. So the property owner would be paying significantly high taxes too. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, it, it makes it makes all the difference. Uh, the one thing about self-storage, another asset that I really, really do like for all the reasons you just pointed out, um, I like the asset. My biggest concern is that most people confuse it to a high degree with multifamily. Oh, it's like this quote, the same thing, you know, in air quotes. And it really isn't. I mean, multifamily, sure, they're both businesses. However, with a self-storage setup, I mean, you're you're looking for vehicles per day. You're looking for how much foot traffic does it get. You're looking for uh, potentially managing an individual there, like a like a property manager, I suppose, unless you automate the whole thing, uh, doing all the marketing, doing all the Facebook ads, targeting all these sorts of things. I mean, it's a whole different scenario compared to multifamily. Is that do you guys feel the same way? Yeah, yeah, it's quite different. Um, remember, you you nobody's residing there, so you have uh, much simpler infrastructure you have lower capex because and lower operating expenses right You're, you don't have utilities there's no plumbing there's much fewer staff maintenance you name it and so you end up having typically a much higher um operating expense margin so excuse me a, a higher profit margin a lower operating ex expense ratio augustino so mobile homes are the same way if you don't own the homes and the tenants are responsible you tend to see expenses again for both these asset classes, storage and mobile homes. You know, Thirty percent operating expenses is not uncommon, and some are lower. And uh, with multifamily, you know, fifty to sixty percent is is somewhat common. And so you have more cash flow, you have lower risk. There's more money getting pumped out of the business, right? For these reasons, um, and then also the flexibility of self storage, the thirty day lease, you can adjust to market quite quickly. Um, the other thing you do have to worry about, Augustino, in self-storage is new supply. That is a big mm -hmm. risk in self-storage, one of the biggest. So you, if you have a facility, um, maybe you're at 80, 70 percent occupancy and you're trying to lease it up and another facility gets built down the road or two or three because there's markets out there that are way oversupplied. You're going to have a hard time hitting your numbers because old, new, they all compete the same. It's all about proximity to jobs and homes and Price, you know, you're, you're storing your stuff there. Most decent self-storage units today, Augustino, they're safe, they're clean, they're respectful, but uh, the pricing and the location is what it comes down to. So if a new one's built down the road, it can uh, have a pretty negative impact on your property's performance. That's, That's right. Real. Yeah. That's right. And people don't need to have storage. They need a place to live. They don't need to have storage. So it becomes way more cost sensitive in that regard like you know it's uh it's very yeah it's ultra competitive it really is ultra competitive you know yeah I, I looked at that business too at one point and just decided that for those for those sorts of reasons you know what i'm going to take a step back and just focus on what i'm good at <laughs> so <you> go. <laughs> <I> do, <laughs> yeah yeah that's right that's right so you know right now every, very very volatile times as we're talking about um trying to find debt certainly very difficult difficult as well how how do you stay strong and how do you prepare for these sorts of scenarios? I know that right now you're paying cash now, like you know, for some of these distressed assets, right? Which some people have access to the cash to, to deals like that. Some some people don't. Um, but it's, it's all about preparing ahead of time. It sounds like for those sorts of opportunities. But staying strong through it is going to be the toughest part, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, as far as deal flow goes, Augustina, it, it's definitely much harder to find great deals today um, than even a year, year and a half ago, right? We're in the middle of 2023. A lot has changed in the last, uh, call it 12 to 16 months. And so how we do it, you know, we've again um, been in these asset classes for a number of years. We partner with operators. A lot of them we have active capital with, we're managing, they're managing our capital and managing our investments uh, and vice versa. And so when they have a deal, Augustino, and they have an acquisitions team that's combing, looking for assets all day long. So, you know, in apartments, for example, we work with several operators 
uh, each one of them good at, at something um, somewhat unique and niche within that space. When they get a deal, hey, Mark, are you interested? Here's a live one. Um, here's a, a, a pro forma, some quick underwriting that we put together. Is this timing, et cetera? Something might work for your family and your company. Um, so we're looking at 10 to 20 deals a month. We invest in, I mean, this year, Augustino, maybe five or six investments. And so it's just a filtration process. We're constantly looking for something that, I mean, today it has to be a wow, like this is almost a no-brainer, right? That's how we look at it um, in order to to proceed and actually invest. And those deals are just harder and harder to come by, but there's always usually something special. There's a story, there's a uniqueness that makes it uh, really stand out from the crowd. And so I think it's uh, a nature of being in this space for well, about 13 years formally now and a little bit prior to that, of course, and having the right relationships with people that are uh, really on the ground day in, day out, looking for uh, some of the best investments out there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing. It's about uh, building the relationships, building the capital sources during the good times so you can be prepared to take advantage of things in the bad times. I mean, not to be you know a, a vulture, so to speak, but also – helping other people out of a certain situation. That's really what it comes down to, you know, not being a jerk about it. You know, it's, uh, I, I think that, yes, there's opportunities out there, uh, but, but uh, the way I like to look at it is you're helping someone else get out of a jam is what you're doing. You know, that's what yeah. that's, you're, you're helping them. You're helping that's them. That's right. And it has to be a win-win, Augustino, right? I mean, yeah. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't typically work out. That's right. That's right. It's, it's, it's not a zero-sum game in, in this business. It really isn't. It really isn't. So, well, good, good. Well, I know, listen, we've been talking about a lot of stuff here, uh, especially when it comes to surviving the distressed asset world or distressed, uh, distressed times like we have right now. What sort of bulletproof advice would you have for someone that say going through some tough times, they don't know what to do with this asset. They, you know, they have, maybe they're having some operational issues. What sort of bulletproof advice would you have to offer them? Having trouble raising capital? Check out my guide that has helped people close millions of dollars. Go to guidetocapital.com and download it today. Yeah, I mean, look, if, if you can wait to sell and continue to operate your asset and have it perform as best as possible, um, I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel, Augustino. Uh, you, you and I were just talking about uh, Marcus and Millichap. They have this this term that they've coined lately that's survived till 25, right? And so what is that? That means if you have staying power, if you don't have to sell right now, if you're not, a, if you're in a position where you don't have to give the keys back to the bank, do whatever you can to, to avoid and just keep going. There's a lot of, um, I would say, optimistic and positive data in the last quarter that has came out regarding, you know, rental trends, occupancy trends, the demand for housing, if you're in apartment space specifically. Uh, and so inflation's been going down for many, several quarters uh, straight now. We've probably seen peak interest rate um, increases. There might be one or two more, but Augustino, nobody's penciling in a huge uh, increase in interest rates going forward. Potentially rates will come down in 2024 and you know they might be in a different market in just 12 months. And so we, we don't know, but uh, if you made it this far and you can continue to hang on, my suggestion is do whatever you can, even if you have to inject additional capital into the deal. I mean, we're seeing that in uh, different operators' assets where they need more capital to continue to, to, to weather the storm and keep going. And so that is a, a viable solution. Try and raise more capital, inject it in the deal if it's needed. And if you have a value-add business plan where you can keep renovating units and growing NOI, you know, try, and, try and keep going. That's the suggestion yeah. I'd make today. No, love it, love it. Operations is king right now. If your operations suck, get rid of the operator. <laughs> That's what I have to say to that. That's right. <laughs> definitely, definitely. All right. Well, guys, if you want to reach out to Mark, you reach him via his website at smkcapital.com. We've got some insight on on really surviving the, the current economic trend. And uh, you know, think about what you're going to have to do to take advantage of some of the, the, the sale that's going to be coming up here uh, at the same time with the mindset of trying to help out the person on the other side too. You know, we don't want to be vultures. We don't want to go in and attack somebody uh, aside from, you know, helping them out. That's what we're looking to do here. We're looking to help people out. All right. Thanks for tuning in guys. I'll see you next episode. Take care. You've been listening to the Bulletproof Cash Flow Show. 
We hope you've enjoyed the show. We know we had fun. Make sure to visit our Apple podcast page and leave us a five-star review. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from the show. For real estate coaching, events, and resources, hit up bulletproofcashflow.com. Till next time. No information in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this show are limited to accredited or sophisticated investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure and subscription documentation and subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice.